We thank You, Lord, that where You are, Lord, there is holy ground. You promised in Your Word, Lord, where two or three were gathered together in, in Your name, Lord, You would be in the midst of them, Lord. God, You are the Creator. You are the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the, the Creator, the Prince of Peace. Jesus, we exalt You as King of kings and Lord of lords. We praise Your name today. We thank You that You died on that cross for our sins, that You rose from the dead, that You conquered sin and death and hell and Satan. You conquered it all, this whole world system. And Lord, we thank You You're coming back one day to com set us completely free from all of the oppression and bondages and, and, and death and destruction. And Lord, the day's coming You're going to wipe away every tear. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more death. It will be destroyed, completely destroyed. Lord, we thank You that the work You've begun on the cross and Your resurrection You will complete when You return. We thank You for it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank You, Lord. Thank You, Lord. Well... I studied something all day yesterday, and that's not it. <laughs> and I mean all day. I want you to turn with me, and the Lord wants us to turn here this morning for sure, because He just keeps speaking this passage, this parable to my heart. But Matthew chapter 13, let's go there this morning. I've talked about this before, preached on this before, but I think there's a place the Lord wants me to emphasize some things that are going on in this passage that I think gets overlooked a lot of times in the church world. Um... Everybody in Matthew chapter 13, are you there? Alright, let's start reading. We're going to read at verse 24. This is the parable of the wheat and the tares that Jesus spoke. Matthew thirteen twenty four. And another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? And he said, Nay, lest while we gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. We're going to go down to verse 34 now. It says here, In all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. So they asked Jesus, explain this. So he answered and said to them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man, or the Lord Jesus himself. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. 
The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers or the servants are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world, or end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then, or after this, shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who has ears to hear, let him hear. The word that keeps standing out to me in this passage is those who offend. I'm going to get to that in just a second, but let me first of all strip away some false ideas about this passage. There are people in the church world that use this passage to say, yes, we have enemies among us and we have false believers among us and we have Satanists and witches and you know people posing as Christians who are not Christians. And basically they say, with these false prophets and false teachers and, and these infiltrators in the church, we might say the tares that are among the wheat, there are people who say, oh, you shouldn't confront them, you shouldn't deal with them, you shouldn't expose them, you shouldn't, um, you know, you shouldn't deal with it as Christians because if you start trying to take up the tares, you're going to pull up some of the wheat. But let me just put the nail in the coffin here. The instruction that the Lord gave to not pull up the tares yet was not to the to human beings it was to the angels the angels are the harvesters the angels are the ones that are come to either take people to heaven by way of the resurrection by way of the rapture or to take people to hell by destruction right god's angels are the instruments of judgment the instruments of the harvest and there are our assistants and our protectors. So that's their instruction, not ours. We are told in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, we are told to have no fellowship with the works of darkness, but rather reprove them. The word reprove means to expose them, to rebuke them, to speak openly about them. That's why Jesus said, beware of false prophets. Pay attention. Discern. Warn. Paul warned. He said in Acts chapter 20, he warned the church of Ephesus. He said, I've, I've warned you night and day with tears. By the space of three years, he said, I've warned you that when I depart, grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Even some of you will become wolves. Okay? Pretty specific, huh? So I just wanted to get that out of the way because that's a complete false teaching that we're just supposed to let anything go willy-nilly in the church, right? We just let anybody teach, anybody preach, let any doctrine come in and everything. And, and actually, it's part of this mentality now that is the reason why so much of the church world is falling into deception and error and opening the door to demons because nobody can just flat out say anymore, that's wrong, you're wrong, this is wrong, and this is why. Right? I say that because I've had so many interesting things happen over the last couple of weeks via Facebook. Um, even yesterday, three different discussions. One with... A very misled young lady believing that when Jesus came the first time, that was the last days. So I don't know what she believes about a second coming. Don't even know if she believes a second coming. She may be like the Jehovah Witnesses that believe Jesus came in 1914 spiritually. Okay? Even though I gave her sign after sign, scripture after scripture, to show there's a difference between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. But, you know, her daddy's a preacher and he told her what to believe. I said, you better, honey, you better, you better know what you believe for yourself. You better get in the book yourself. Because, of course, she said, I'll have my daddy give you scriptures. I said, no, you better learn how to give me scriptures. I said, because I'm giving them to you and you're not giving me anything. But this deception, this mentality, oh, oh, and, and by the way, 
it was funny because I'm on a post with somebody else. I'm talking to somebody else. She comes on there telling us we're wrong, right? Telling me I'm wrong. When I tell her, no, you're wrong, she says, you're bullying. I'm like, I just did the same thing you just did. See, this is the game that gets played. I can correct you, but you can't correct me. That's a Democrat liberal idea, I think. Right? I can do whatever I want. I love the whole thing. People come on, don't judge me. You're a bigot. You're a hypocrite. Don't judge me. Well, aren't you judging me? Calling me a bigot and a hypocrite? So while you're, ju- while you're telling me not to judge you, you're judging me in the process. You shouldn't be correcting people. Well, aren't you correcting me about correcting people? Right? I think some of these people, as the Bible says, even a fool is considered wise when he keeps his mouth shut. Right? But then he opens his mouth and removes all doubt. Right? So that's an important part of this story. Right? Now he tells us very plainly here, Jesus says, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. So he identifies himself. He says, The field is the world. The entire world. The good seed of the children of the kingdom, but the tares of the children of the wicked one. Now let's be very clear here when he says the tares, we're we're talking about the whole world. Now is the whole world the kingdom of God? No. No, no, no. Now, does the earth belong to the Lord? Yes, it does. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But the people of the world, it says the people are the Lord's too, technically. But we also know that Jesus looked at the Pharisees in John 8 and he said, you are of your father, the devil. Right? He said, unless a man is born again, believing on Jesus Christ, he said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Right? John 3. Everybody staying with me? So, apart from being saved through faith and turning from your sins and being born again in Jesus Christ... You cannot be in the kingdom of God. Therefore, you're in the kingdom of Satan. You are under the authority and power of the God of this world, the prince and power of the air, the satanic powers of darkness, right? So there are two kingdoms. And that's what Jesus is showing us here in this parable. That in the whole world, there's wheat and there's tares. Okay? There's people who have been born again. They are children of God. They've been saved. They are the wheat, and the tares are the children of the wicked one. Right? Kind of self-explanatory. Right? But then he goes on and he says this. And this is what's interesting, because this parable really is about the end times. He said, let both grow together until the harvest... And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, go and gather the tares and bind them into bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, he kind of generalizes there in verse 30, but he gets a little more specific when he explains it. Verse 39, he says, The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, the reapers are the angels, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Now, folks, I'm not going to turn there, but of course you can turn there if you want to. But in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, there is going to be a day of God's wrath beyond any other day. This is the great day of God's wrath that it speaks about. And you can read about it. It talks about there the day that Jesus puts his feet down on the Mount of Olives, that there will be an earthquake so great that the world beyond any earthquake the world has ever seen. It says there that the cities of the nations will fall, all of them. It says that every mountain will be moved out of its place and every island will be moved. Y'all reading that? Some of you turn there, right? It says great hailstones are going to come down out of heaven a hundred pounds apiece to fall upon the wicked. 
Now you have to remember the context in which this is in, is this is at the very end. This is at the second coming. By this time, Revelation 13 makes it very clear that by this time you're only going to have two groups of people in the world. Those who have refused to take the mark of the beast and have put faith in Jesus and those who have taken the mark of the beast and are worshiping Satan. Pretty much is going to be it. There may be a few who find themselves in the middle that get to enter into the millennial reign as normal human beings, but they're going to be few. But here's the deal. This great day of God's wrath he will, on that day, destroy all the wicked. All those who rebelled. All those who wanted to indulge in sorcery and lust and sexual immorality and worship the beast and the, and the world government and the Antichrist and, and follow that whole road. All of them are going to be gathered up, destroyed at the second coming of the Lord and thrown into Hell, all of them will be thrown into the fire. At that moment. Again, I'm helping you understand this parable. Okay? That's why, he, that's why in the parable he talks about the tares at the end, the wicked ones being gathered up first and thrown into hell. Because there is going to be a destruction of the wicked as Jesus comes to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem and the millennial reign that's going to go for a thousand years. All right? Now this is important. So the tares are gathered, the children of the wicked one, and thrown into the furnace of fire. But the parable is not over yet. Everybody pay attention. Look at me. Did you hear what I just said? We just dealt with all the wicked at the second coming of Jesus. All the unsaved, all the wicked are gathered up, didn't we? They're all gathered up, placed in hell. I showed you the great day of God's wrath, right? Even the Antichrist and the false prophet get it on that day. Okay? And they'll be cast into hell. But here, the parable continues. Somebody say, uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. So, because if we dealt with the tares, we only got the wheat left. Right? right. 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 As far as you want, save, always say, believers out there listening. Here we go. Second coming, we've dealt with the unsaved. But the parable's not over yet. And we might as well not say parable because... At this point, Jesus is explaining what it means exactly. So we don't even have to give it our own interpretation. Jesus told us, right? Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. So verse 40, he says, As therefore the tares, the children of the wicked one, are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Then we got another issue to deal with. It says, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom. Uh-oh. We're not talking about the world here because Jesus just said we're going to gather out of his kingdom. Now how do you get in his kingdom? You had to have been saved at some point in time. You had to have believed. You had to have been born again. You had to have repented. At some point, you had to have accepted Jesus and been saved. Right? He says, The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do or practice habitually and continually iniquity or sin. Uh oh. And notice what it says with these that want to cause, the word offend means to cause someone to stumble or to trap someone 
You are a stumbling block. Your life, your words, your teaching, your example causes other people to stumble and fall away from God and fall into sin and fall into hell. He says those who are stumbling blocks, those who cause people to trip, stumble, and fall into sin and into eternal damnation, and those who practice sinful habits and iniquity, he says this about them. He will gather them out of his kingdom. Uh Uh-oh. Verse 42, And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then, after this judgment, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And notice how Jesus ends this. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is one of those parables that are vitally important. Now why do I say this? Why do I know it? I, I think the Lord wanted me, even though I've preached on this before, I wrote about it in Grace Abuse. But this thing about being an offense, being a stumbling block, um, you know, as many of you already know, and I shared a little bit last week, God uses this little church and this little ministry to minister to a lot of people outside of, of, of this church. Um, I think Kevin showed me we had, what, just in a week, last week, I think 300 plus podcast downloads, not to mention all the blog talk. Uh, listens, uh, I mean, we're it, it, it's getting crazy. It's crazy. It really is. And but I'm, what I'm amazed at is how many people are telling me crazy stuff that's going on in the church world. You know, like this girl taught by her daddy, who's a preacher, that the last days were when Jesus came the first time. So she's oblivious to anything else because she's been taught wrong. Now hopefully this is not going to make her stumble, but it could. Especially in what is about to happen and not being prepared. Right? Um, there's a person that um, Nancy and, and, and I have been counseling and trying to help uh, leave a homosexual lifestyle. And God is working powerfully in them. And as they began to leave this sin and give their life to the Lord and get right with God, they went to a church because they don't live here. And they went to visit a church and and shared with the church, the pastors, or shared with somebody that, that, you know, they they were wanting help with this. And this church tells them, that's okay. Huh? Oh, a friend that was a Christian told them that it's okay for them to be homosexual. Don't, don't, don't sweat it. So they're Christian. And I'm sitting here going, thank God this person didn't listen to this stupid Christian who could have caused this person to fall back, who's struggling and, and coming out of a, a terrible situation, could have caused them to fall again. And go just give up and go back to that lifestyle and die and go to hell. And then of course, yesterday, someone starts in, because I mentioned an article about a Mormon senator who went to visit the Pope and, and he and Joel Osteen visited the Pope on the same day. All right. So I said, here we got the universalist, Joel Osteen, that believes all religions will lead to God. doesn't really matter what you believe. And we've got the Mormons who believe that, that Jesus is not God and Jesus and Lucifer are brothers. And we got these hanging out with the Pope. And I talked about the formation of this one world religion is going to be about accepting everything and everybody. Right? So this started in elder, an elder of the Mormon church 
started a discussion with me. And I just sat here and go, wow, the unsuspecting Christian who does not know their Bible and the foundational doctrines of Christianity, this guy could shake you off of your foundation. But he's a stumbling block. Denying the deity, the true nature of Jesus Christ as God manifested in the flesh, how to be saved. I just kept putting it on him. He said something about that, because see, they don't believe in the, the Trinity, that God is one God, but three distinct revelations. They believe there's three gods. Right? They also, well, they don't really believe Jesus is fully God, just he's a God to them, not the God. He's a God. All right? And so, you know, of course the word Trinity is not in the Bible. But neither is eschatology. Right? Neither is the word Macintosh. But we use that too. <laughs> yes, as my wife just pointed out, the word Bible is not even in the Bible. Right? But this guy said, well, Trinity is not in the Bible. I said, oh, let's not start down the road of what's not in the Bible. I said, the founder of your church, Joseph Smith, met an angel who's not mentioned in the Bible, who gave him a book that's not in the Bible, and gave him a whole lot of things like God on the planet Kolob with his spiritual wives having spiritual children. I said, that's not in the Bible either. I said, so you really want to go down this road? About what's not in the Bible? Like golden tablets? Like Joseph Smith, who was a Freemason and a sorcerer and carried around an amulet stone that he uh, practiced divination with? You want to talk about what's not in the Bible? You follow a Freemason sorcerer who created a religion to enrich himself and so he could come up with a way to have all the wives he wanted to have. And he had about 30. And you want to talk to me about what's not biblical. But the foolish Christian or the Christian who doesn't know these things or understand like the basic concept of the Trinity and the deity of Jesus, they're in trouble. This is why I harp on you. Study your Bible. Study to show yourself approved. Get it down in you. And of course, you know, when I, when I kept pounding him with it, I said, isn't it interesting? I said, you say that God is these three different beings, three gods. I said, isn't it interesting when God made man, he didn't make three men when he made man in his image. Uh oh, he made one man who had three parts. I said, just like he is. He didn't have much to say about that. He said, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. I said, no, but the concept is. Because the word Elohim is plural in Hebrew. And it is the word in Hebrew used when God said, let us make man in our image. And so God said, let us, Elohim, make man, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let's make man just like we are. In the sense that he's going to be just like us, our image look like us and have what we have. So he makes one man, Adam, and Adam has a spirit, a soul, and a body. We know that from 1 Thessalonians 5.23. That man, each man, each woman, each, each, each living human being has three parts. But there's not three Andes. There's not three Pauls. There's not three Marlenes. There's not three Deans. Right? <laughs> Duh. Right? But why do they do this? Listen to me, folks. All false religions. From now, your Pope Francis, Roman Catholic Pope, to um, Islam, to Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, Baha'i, New Age. They all have one thing in common. You want to know what that is? They all say this lie. Jesus was a good man. Jesus was a prophet. Jesus was a great teacher. 
But he was not God in the flesh. Or the Son of God, part of the revelation of God as a three-part being. So they all deny the deity of Jesus as God in the flesh, and they all deny that he is the only way to heaven. Look at me, y'all. Listen closely. This is the lie of the spirit of Antichrist. This lie that God is all about love and it doesn't matter what you believe and Jesus was a great teacher but he's not uniquely the Messiah or uniquely God in the flesh. He's a way, not the way. This is the lie that many Christians are accepting now. It's like your friend that was here. Good Christian people who had solid Christian upbringing in sound biblical churches are now through these stumbling blocks, through these people who are, are bringing in these subtle offenses causing many to stumble. Because, you know, I mean, I've talked a lot about, we, we know, this church ought to know, and anybody who listens to our sermons know that we know there's certain sins the Bible speaks of unto death that if you practice habitually and continually, you will not go to heaven. Galatians 5, Ephesians 5, 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, Revelation 21, 7 through 8. Hear what I'm about to tell you. The Christian man or woman who either gets deceived or begins deceiving people and causing other people to stumble will find themselves in the lake of fire for eternity. These are not my words. These are the words of Jesus Christ. These are the words of the Bible. You're either helping people come to the knowledge of the truth and come into the kingdom the right way, or you are a stumbling block by either your words, your teaching, your doctrine, or your lifestyle. What are you? Ask yourself, what am I? Am I a stumbling block? Or am I helping people get saved? Am I helping people find the truth? Am I leading them to the truth of Scripture? Am I leading them to the truth of Jesus Christ of the Bible? Am I leading them to repentance and turning from sin and hating sin? Am I leading them to faith in the blood of the cross and the resurrection? Am I leading them to the truth that Jesus is the only way and will only, always, only be the only way? Am I doing my best to be an example of a true Christian? I know none of us will do it perfectly all the time, but are we doing our best to try to live what we preach and what we believe? Don't be a stumbling block. Don't be an offense. Don't be a deceiver. The Bible says if you cause one of these little ones that believe in me, Jesus said, if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for you. And a millstone were hung about your neck and you would drown in the depths of the sea than to do that. It ought to terrify us that there could be the possibility that we could lead other people astray. This is why preachers, pastors, teachers, ministers of the gospel are going to give a greater account to God for what we have taught and what we have preached. This is why I preach the way I do and I teach what I do because I'm not afraid of you, I'm afraid of Him. Too many pastors fear their people. They don't fear God.
Let me tell you, you tell people they're once saved, always saved, no matter how they live, that is a, an offense. That is a stumbling block. You tell people that Christian can't have a demon and can't need deliverance and healing, you're going to be a stumbling block to that person. You tell people that they're going to, be, they're going to go in a pre-trib rapture when the Bible says the complete opposite. All these things. Listen, all false teaching is dangerous. Say, like, brother, you shouldn't be so adamant. Oh, yeah, I should. You know, we covered this this past week. Uh, if you didn't hear it, the, the, the radio show, what well, we did, Blood on Their Hands, where American pastors have failed their flock. Most American pastors, and, I, and this saddens me to say this, most of them are these stumbling blocks. Most of them are going to be shocked when an angel walks up and snatches them and throws them in the lake of fire. As they scream, but Lord, but Lord, I preached for you. I was a pastor. I was a teacher. I, t I told people about you. And he's going to say, you're an offense to me. You had my word and you taught your denomination's doctrine. You taught your Bible school's doctrine. You taught your own ideas and opinions. You taught what the culture thought was popular. You led people astray. You caused people to stumble. And listen, the homosexuality issue is right now, it is drawing a line down through the church world. And you will be on the side of God and righteousness or you will take the other side and say it's okay or it doesn't matter and you will be a stumbling block and your testimony as a Christian will lead others to hell and you will go into the furnace of fire yourself. Unless you fall on your face and you repent of this sin. Don't die or be standing here when Jesus comes with other people's blood on your hands. Tell the truth. I'd rather hurt somebody's feelings than see them go to hell. I'd rather make them cry. Make them hate me if it leads them to come back to the Lord. Make them hate me for a season. If that's what it takes. This is serious. Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, Pope Francis. These guys who won't tell the truth and are saying they represent Jesus Christ. An angel is going to snatch them up on that day march them over to the flames of hell and put them in. If they don't repent before that day, it's coming. I saw Joel Osteen interviewed by the Huffington Post. Point blank asked him about the homosexual issue you know what he said? That's just not my message. I just, he goes, I just don't want to be sidetracked by that. It's just not my message. It's just not what we're about. You're the pastor of the largest church in America. And you don't believe that homosexuality and homosexual marriage and the homosexual sin is an important subject to address clearly? No, you're a stumbling block, my friend. You and your buddy, Oprah, New Age, Diva. No, birds of a feather flock together. You and Oprah and Deepak Chopra and oh, Shirley MacLaine and all the other New Age. It doesn't matter. 
And guess who all is going down this road? T.D. Jakes. Stumbling blocks, folks. Stumbling blocks. It's the Greek word scandalon. It means to cause to stumble, to give an occasion to sin, to be a trap stick, literally to set a trap and cause someone to be caught in the trap of sin. Let's read it again. See, as you turn in there in Matthew 13 again, I want us to read it. Because I want you to see it. Let this be imprinted on your brain. Listen. This, this guy yesterday, this Mormon elder, who had elder blank blank, as his Facebook name. He said, now these were his words. He pulled up the scripture about he that does good is of God. He goes, you know, the Mor- basically saying the Mormon church does a lot of good. So that means they're of God. I think you're confused. I thought to myself, oh boy. I said, you know, I said, let's see, you want to go down that road? I said, you can't take the scriptures out of context. Hitler did some good things too. He fixed the German economy, right? I said, but we know what else he was doing. And I said, there are many Freemasons and Shriners who do a lot of good in charities while they worship Lucifer behind the scenes in secret. And I told him, I said, even the Antichrist, the Bible says, will come as a man of peace doing good at first. I said, so really? Is that, that's your, that's the best argument huh? that we got. Good. Doing good. Right? Let's read it again, folks. Verse 37, he answered and said to them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, the good seed of the children of the kingdom, but the tares of the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do or practice habitually. And the word do, by the way, is a present tense Greek verb as well, meaning continuous ongoing action. So he says, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend in them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The American church, I'm afraid the vast portion of it is going to be guilty of turning against the true Christians. I've been reading excerpts of Tom Horn's upcoming book. It's called Blood on the Altar. And it's talking about the coming war within the church world, Christian against Christian. And I've read, he's got like six or seven parts, articles on his website now sharing things that's going to be in this upcoming book. And what I've read so far is terrifying. Because the people, listen to, hear what I'm saying. There will be Baptist folks and Methodist folks and Presbyterian folks and even charismatic Pentecostal folks when the stuff hits the fan. They will turn on us. Mark it down. There were Christians in Germany in World War II and leading up to it that slowly began to buy into what Hitler was doing and became some of the worst concentration camp guards that existed. 
and justified it as we are following orders. why Christians are being demonized by everyone. My God, our own government hates us. They're, they're demonizing us through the Pentagon, through the Department of Homeland Security, uh, through uh, the military, even Austin's commander repeated that to the whole division that Christians are now domestic terrorists. The movies now are coming out. Now it's not the Middle Eastern terrorists or not the villains in the movies. Now it's Christian patriots who believe in the Constitution. Now we're the enemy. And it's exactly what Hitler did leading up to the Holocaust of the Jews. And not just the 6 million Jews, but the other 16 million or whatever, 12 million more people that he killed. But you must demonize. You must make these people out to be the enemy somehow in some way so that you can convince the rest of the population why we should get rid of them. Churches, and particularly Catholic churches in Germany, went along with what was happening. Don't for a second believe that these people right here, these stumbling blocks, don't for a second think that they won't turn on you when it comes down to maybe their family getting the chip and getting some food. This is why it's so vitally important to embrace the entire truth of the Scriptures to embrace the truth and to be bold and to be strong. The church, can I just say, we're lacking bold voices. There are people luring Christians into these false doctrines and these false beliefs. And a lot of the reason is because no one's there to protest. No one's there to give the other side. No one's there to give an answer. No one's willing to challenge we don't want to upset anybody. We don't want to confront anybody. We don't want to make anybody mad. We don't want people to not like us. We don't, you know, we're afraid we'll be rejected or hated or uh, misunderstood. <laughs> when we stand before God, the Bible says, we will be without excuse. No excuses. There won't be, ah, I didn't know. Especially if you said at Fire Grace Church. You will, you, will, you will give an account because you know. Right? The challenge is going to come later on to be silent so that we won't suffer persecution or rejection. You're going to make up your mind now. Am I going to be a voice of truth, of the Word of God, of the Gospel? of correct doctrine, correct theology? Am I going to stand up for the truth, be bold for the truth, no matter what it costs me for the sake of others? Or am I going to shut my mouth and try to get along and try to survive as long as possible or try to you know, hide what I am? So I don't understand. We can't really hide. We can't hide because God's called us to be a light to the world. A city on a hill that cannot be hid. He said you don't put your light under a bushel. You don't get quiet when it gets dark. The light is needed when it is dark. And we are needed. Amen? God needs us to be bold. Fearless. Courageous. Loud. Outspoken. Blunt, forward, and offensive. Confrontation is the way of the gospel. Confrontation, you can't have gospel preaching without confronting a problem. Without stirring up someone's emotions or their wrong beliefs or their bad attitude or their sinful habit or whatever. 
There is, it's impossible. I don't understand American Christianity that thinks we can water it down, quiet it down, make it look as, as warmly as possible, and the world will love us. When you do that, you have ceased to preach the Gospel. You, you have ceased to, to present the cross of Jesus Christ as the only answer to human sin and, and, and death and, and eternal life. You've ceased to be salt. You're salt that's lost its savor. Seeker-sensitive Christianity is absurd. Pope Francis is absurd. Joel Osteen is absurd. They are stumbling blocks, false witnesses, liars, deceivers. That's just too strong. No apologies. It's facts. Oh, my brothers and sisters. Now I got to close with this, but this one just set me off this morning. Before it's news. Well known. Very popular website. Right? Even posted my article on it. About dreams of an impending nuclear attack. I mean, I don't know the people. I've never met them. I don't know any of them who run it. I don't know anything about them. I know they post some good stuff. I know they post some weird stuff. But they just posted an article today by some nut... Who's saying that the Antichrist is not a man. But that wasn't what troubled me the most. Because there's some people that believe the Antichrist is going to be Satan himself. Just masquerading. But the Bible is very clear that he's a man. His body will be given to the flame. The devil is not a man. Satan is not a man. He's a fallen angel. So the Antichrist has said very plainly many places. He will be a man. And he will have a body and it will be given to the flame. Okay? Um, but this article also went on to say and I love how they just slipped it in you think you're getting well you know maybe a decent article and it was posted Quail posted it but it was a, a decent article about the end times stuff you know maybe you don't have to disagree with everybody on everything but then it goes down the road that people who reject God that end up going to hell when they're thrown in the lake of fire, the second death, they cease to exist. That, that the punishment of hell is not eternal. Literally. And I thought, here is a popular Christian website that posts a lot of Christian, good Christian material. Here's another guy, maybe, who knows, who, who posted it for Quail's site. But here's Christians, whether knowingly or unknowingly, Promoting a very dangerous error that hell is not eternal. Now nobody wants hell to be eternal. But here are the facts. Revelation 14 says, those who take the mark, the smoke of their torment, not that they cease to exist, the smoke of their torment will rise day and night forever. The teaching of Jesus, we see, of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, when the rich man was in hell and lifted up his eyes, he said, being in torment, I, I want one drop of water to cool my tongue. I am tormented by this flame. Jesus said that the punishment of hell is everlasting. It's eternal. It's forever. It doesn't stop. Yet here's a Christian website basically saying that hell is over. There, that people will die and when in, in the end the second death is just ceasing to exist. No more 
no eternal damnation. No, but I looked at these words and I've looked this up. But again, distorting the teaching on hell. Once we distort the teaching on eternal punishment, we're basically teaching universalism. There is, see, fundamental Christianity. There is a real heaven. There is a real hell. You will spend eternity in one of them. You are spirit, soul, and body. And you will be in one of those places forever because your spirit and your soul are eternal. You will live forever in one of those places. And now Christians are lying about it. And someone who hears that, there may be people who hear that will go, you know, well, if I'm just going to be annihilated, I don't care. I'm just going to live in sin and I'll be annihilated and I'll cease to exist one day. That's the teaching, by the way, the false teaching of Jehovah Witnesses. You know what I'm saying? All, hear this and remember this. All false teaching that strays from the Bible is dangerous and leads to death and destruction. For somebody. Somebody may not take it the whole route. But for somebody that's going to believe it and take it in, it will affect them for all eternity. So what are you going to be? Stumbling block? Or a preacher of truth? See, I made up my mind. Come hell or high water, or both. Right? makes people nervous too. You want to make people nervous? Lose completely any desire or any concern about whether they like you or not. It is. It's freedom, man. So I love you, but I don't care if your feelings are hurt. I don't care if you don't like the truth. I don't care if it upsets you. I don't care if it disturbs you. I don't care if it makes you angry or makes you cry. I don't care if it is the truth that will lead you to salvation in Jesus Christ and to walk with Him and to be saved forever. And one day, you may hate me now, but one day if you make it, you will thank me. And I'm okay with that. And guess what? If you don't make it, I'm planning on making it. So we, me and you won't see each other anymore anyway. Right? So either way, I'm good. My job is to not be a son of law. And I look back on periods of my life when I was struggling bad. And I wasn't being a good example. I wasn't being a good example to people around me or my kids. Um, I went through a rough time where I basically walked away. Not from God or believing in God, but I just walked away from the church. I walked away from preaching. I walked away. I was in too much pain and I was in just too much confusion and darkness. And it was, it was, a, it was a very difficult time for me. But I look back on that and I shudder. I mean, I look back on that and I absolutely shudder and think, how many people did I miss that I was supposed to reach during that time? How many people saw me not doing what I should have been doing? And it might have caused them to stumble. I want to assure you, I've been uh, on my knees about that and pray for God's mercy and forgive me if I caused anyone to stumble or struggle or fall. It's a serious matter. And we've all had our bad moments, haven't we? (laughs) Thank God He will forgive us, but we must what? Confess our sins and repent and turn from them and ask for mercy and change. (laughs) 
Imagine that. God wants us to change. Alright? Well, I don't fully know exactly why God impressed that parable on me so strong this morning, but I got a good idea. It was very important for somebody. I hope you learned something. Um, it's not going to get easier out there. I'm afraid to say. The church world, the tares are all among them, and most of them think the tares are. You know, t- the thing about tares is a lot of people don't realize is tares they look just like wheat. They're almost you almost can't tell them apart. But the tares are stealing nutrients and things that that the wheat needs. It's kind of like, you know, having weeds in your garden. I mean, you don't want the weeds eating up what your, what your vegetables and your crops need, right? But they look very similar. Kind of hard to tell. But they're all over the place. And, and what's interesting, he said, both would grow together until the harvest. Now, what is harvest time? Harvest is when... What has been growing comes to its full maturity. So at the same time, this is why we're seeing that at the same time, there is a church, a remnant church arising in the earth that's growing to its maturity and strength and understanding. And there is great evil and the evil ones are coming to the pinnacle of their power to take over the world. And that's why we, we are at the moment of the greatest clash between the true church and Satan's satanic system that's ever happened in the history of mankind. We're the lucky ones. <laughs> you know, something I think about this, you know, I need to shut up, but... I think about this because I look back, you know, I've been looking at some stuff. The Dark Ages. God, how many people couldn't even read? Nobody had Bibles. The Roman Catholic Church dominated everything and was killing people left and right. I'm glad I didn't live in that time. At least we live in a time where the truth has been made widely available and proven. And God willing, next week, we're going to get into some pretty amazing things, I hope, if God lets me, about science and the Bible. And science in the Bible. I've learned some things I didn't even know. It's just amazing me. And truly... We're going to get into it, but the invisible things from the creation, God has made it where man will have no excuse. And then I'll show you and compare the true scientific facts that have been proven in science that are in the Bible versus the foolishness that's in the Koran. You know what I found out? I found out that the Koran, much of the Koran was plagiarized from the Jewish Talmud and the Midrash and all the the second century Jewish writings. Word for word in places. The Koran is a plagiarized farce of a religious book that has no comparison to the Bible. Not Not even near the same plane of existence. So get ready for a wild ride. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask you, Lord, to help us all be children of the light, God. Truly the light of Jesus Christ, the light of the gospel, the light of the word of God. Just like we sang today, Lord, your word is a, is a light unto my path. It's a lamp and it's a light to my path. And I just thank you, Lord, that your word is light and your Holy Spirit puts fire upon that light. 
And I thank You that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And I thank You, God, for all the scientific proof, all the archaeological proof, all the manuscript proof, that all the evidence is there. That Your Word is supernatural. That Your Word, truly only the Creator could know the facts that You revealed thousands of years ago. And Lord, I pray that many will come out of Islam and Jehovah Witnesses and Mormonism and Roman Catholicism and, and New Age Oprah religion and come to know the true Jesus Christ before it is too late, before they take the mark. Help us realize that we must seize the short time we have left to be a bold voice for the truth. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I felt that real strong right there. Hear what I'm saying. Listen to me. There is only a short time to be that bold witness and that bold voice for God. The bolder you are now, the more fruit you will have. You know what I'm saying? This is no time to hold back. No time to hold back. There's some pretty scary scenarios working out there right now that I won't even get into. But I wouldn't waste any time. And I will even say this, I wouldn't waste any time on any final preparations of things you need to prepare. Don't waste any time. I think some things got God pushed back some things that were supposed to happen in 2013, I don't know how much longer they will get pushed back. So, don't waste any time. Get your heart full of the Word. Be a bold witness wherever you are and to people around you. Prepare your home and your situation and any other preparations you need. Don't, don't uh, dilly-dally around, as they say. Right?